Welcome to the 2011 CIFL Rules Presentation. The purpose of this video is to prevent points of emphasis to the league in a consistent manner. This video is not a replacement for reading the rules or policies of the CIFL. As a coach or league official, it is your responsibility to know and understand the rules and ask questions of veteran members of the league and officials in order to continue to educate yourself about the rules of football in the CIFL. Let's begin by reviewing the objectives of the CIFL. These objectives are set forth in the CIFL bylaws and can be downloaded at CIFL.org. Objective 1. To educate in the appreciation of sports and to encourage systematic physical exercise. Objective 2. To educate youth, regardless of race, sex, creed, or national origin, to practice the ideals of sportsmanship, scholarship, and physical fitness by example and instruction. Objective 3. To promote and participate in the civic advancement of our community. And Objective 4. To familiarize youth with the fundamentals of football to provide an opportunity to play in a game in a supervised, organized, and safety-oriented manner. It is important that as a coach and leader in the CIFL that you practice and implement these objectives during the entire course of the season and beyond. As we begin practice in the extreme heat, it is important that, as coaches, you are conscious of how the excessive heat affects players, how to manage the heat during practices and games, and how to recognize when a player might be suffering from a heat-related illness. Please watch this short video with tips on how to manage the heat during practice and games. Well, we're getting into the heat of summer, and this is when football camps across the country start gearing up and it's about this time every year that we see the newspaper articles start to pop up about kids who die from heat illness. But why are so many kids suffering from heat exhaustion when there's so much information to be found about hydration? We're going to address some of those topics today and find out what we can do to make our kids safer with friend of the show and director of sports medicine here at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, Dr. David Marshall. Doc, thanks once again. Thank you for having me. So, simply. What can football coaches, that's what we're talking about right now, I guess it goes for any sport, but football coaches in general, what can they do to make sure their kids are safe? Well, with, it, with any ailment in sports, whether it's knee injuries or concussions or, or, or heat illness, which is what we're going to talk about, it's, it's, it's education. The, the coaches, the trainers, if they're present, the, the kids and the parents need to be educated on things that you can do, not just to recognize and treat heat illness, but also to prevent it from happening. All right, so the first thing I would guess is knowing when to practice? Yeah, that, that's a good point. That here in the South, it's, uh, it gets pretty hot, and there's recommendations and guidelines as to how to alter your practice um, based on, on the heat index. And the heat index is, is a measure of relative humidity and ambient temperature. For example, if it's, if it's 85 degrees outside with a, with a relative humidity of 90%, then the heat index might be well into the, into the upper 90s or low 100s. And, there, and there's charts that are, that are available um, readily that, that give, give the heat index. Really, all you need to do is be able to measure the relative humidity, which can be obtained on the web, and just have, have a thermometer then. All right, so you've got the relative humidity get the temperature mm -hmm. on your chart, you know whether it's safe to practice, you've decided we can go practice today, right. what do you do next to make sure your kids are hydrated? Well, when, when it's deemed safe for the kids to go out on the field, then you need to decide whether you should alter your practices um, to, to accommodate the, the heat. For example, there's different zones in the heat chart. There's the, there's the, the yellow zone, which is where, yeah, you, meet, you might need to have a little more frequent water breaks. Maybe every 15 to 20 minutes of exercise, the kids need to take a break, go find a shaded area, and be required to drink. Oftentimes, a kid should be, should be required to take their helmets and shoulder pads off to increase that evaporative cooling, which is the most, uh, most efficient way to cool our bodies during, the, uh, during, during exercise then. Um, uh, there's other zones, which is the orange zone, which you can see on the chart, where the, the kids might need to be required to practice indoors, or they might require to be practiced in t-shirts and shorts and not be allowed to put that, uh, that, that gear on. Because really, a full football um, equipment is going to cover 60% of your total body area, which really decreases your body's ability to cool itself through sweating and evaporation. Would you suggest football coaches, because we, we tend to be kind of in a zone <laughs> where in practice, yeah. designate one person on the field to keep time, decide this they, is when we need a break? That's a great point. If, they have, if, they have the, if they're fortunate enough to have an athletic trainer at the, at the practice, then that's the athletic trainer's job is to make sure that, that those 
uh, policies are followed. However, the youth sports and even our peewee leagues uh, don't have the, the luxury of an athletic trainer. So you're right. So one of the coaches, whether it's the head coach or preferably an assistant coach, be the one to watch the clock, to blow the whistle and say, hey guys, mandatory water break. Another thing to think about is the game time, that there's really no reason why a referee can't have scheduled TV timeouts for, for water breaks or soccer matches. Why can't we divide a soccer game on a Saturday afternoon into four quarters rather than two halves. So there should be built-in breaks um, required by the, by the officials to have, have water breaks. All right, so you've decided whether or not it's safe to mm -hmm. practice. You've built in water breaks at appropriate intervals and decide what kind of equipment to wear and how to do practice. Right. Is there anything else you can do as a coach? Well, there's a lot of things they, they can do, and this is, this is the preparation phase. They need to make sure that they have an identifiable shaded area. If, if they practice near a big tree, identify some big tree as, as the place where the kids go um, if they're suffering a heat illness or just during breaks. If you don't have access to a tree or shaded area, then you might need to purchase one of those big 10 by 10 or 12 by 12 pop-up tents and set that up for every practice. Uh, that, can, that can be very helpful. I like the kids to employ what's called the buddy system. So every kid has a buddy on their team that they kind of watch over. Um, that, way, that way you don't have to rely on a coach to notice if a kid's starting to really sweat, starting to get lightheaded, just not acting right, that every player, every couple minutes or every huddle, you identify your buddy, you make eye contact, give yourself a head nod, make sure you're okay. And I think that's a, that can be a very helpful tool in early identification of a kid who might be getting into trouble. It's a lot of great information mm -hmm. as usual, and I'll just close with this thought. A lot of times I think that we underestimate what kids are capable of, especially mentally, and what they can mm -hmm. handle. And when we talk about education, people automatically think educating the coaches and educating the parents. But with this buddy system, you're saying educate the kids and make the kids aware of how important hydration right. is. Take care of each other. All right, That's Doc. It. It's a team sport. We appreciate it, buddy. Thank you. To review, it's very important that we be aware of the heat index, take frequent water breaks, remove helmets and shoulder pads to increase airflow, move to shaded areas during breaks, Employ the buddy system to identify other players who might be suffering from heat-related illness and use general common sense when dealing with the heat at our practices. Additional resources about preventing heat-related illnesses are available online at IHSA.org. Concussions are a growing concern at all levels of the game of football. In April 2011, the IHSA approved a new policy requiring all Illinois high school athletes who leave a game with a suspected head injury to be cleared by a licensed health care provider before returning to play or practice. Although the CIFL does not have a written policy in place to address concussions, it is best that a player who leaves the game with a suspected head injury be cleared by on-site medical personnel before returning to a game. It is also encouraged that the parents of any player with a suspected head injury be notified and it is highly recommended that that player be evaluated by a licensed health care provider before returning to play or practice. The majority of us are not medical professionals. However, it is important that as a coach or league official, you familiarize yourself with the symptoms and behaviors that might indicate a player has a concussion. In addition, it is best with any injury to err on the side of caution when dealing with young athletes. For more information regarding concussions, please log on to IHSA. Org. Game day duties for coaches extend beyond the playing field. On game day, please help by identifying parents who can volunteer to be play counters, members of the chain crew, or scorekeepers if needed. Since these positions in some cases can affect the outcome of a game, please try to use adults to fill these positions whenever possible. Prior to the game, it's important that you use the captain's meeting as an opportunity to review any rule questions or get answers to any questions you might have about specific rules or game situations. If officials do not make mention to specific rules related to your division, please politely remind them of any special rules that may apply, such as the no blitzing rule at the Mighty Might level. District directors are also available to assist with any rule questions throughout the game. Cut blocks will not be allowed at any level of the CIFL. A cut block occurs when a player blocks or attempts to block around or below the knees. Okay, we're going to bring Ryan and Peyton back in, and we're going to demonstrate some blocking that is pertinent to the entire league. This is not just Mighty Might rule. This is for the entire league. If you guys want to come on in here. Now, Peyton is going to be on offense. Ryan is going to be on defense, and these gentlemen are on the line. They're in the free blocking zone. Go ahead and get in your stance, guys. 
First thing we're going to talk about is a cut block. A cut block is illegal in Mighty Mites, Juniors, and Seniors. Now, at the hike of the ball, you're going to come up, you're up, you're going to go, and a cut block is if he goes below the knees, which is hard for him to do because Peyton's really tall and Ryan is not, but anything that goes directly to the knees is a cut block. Even if you're in the free blocking zone, it is not accepted and is illegal in the CIFL. This is designed simply to protect the knees of our young, young athletes. So once again, in any league, Mighty Mites, juniors or seniors, there is no cut block, which is directly to the knees. Now, if Peyton goes, he makes contact up here. So you make contact with a block up top. And then he goes low, and he gets to the knees. That is accepted, and that is a legal block. But you cannot go directly towards the knees. Chop blocks are also illegal at all levels of the CIFL. Please watch the following video from the ACC regarding chop blocks. Chop block. Chop block is a high-low or low-high combination block by any two players against an opponent, not the ball carrier, anywhere on the field with or without delay between the blocks. The low component is at the opponent's thigh or below. Some key words, high-low, combination, anywhere in the field, and that this low one is at the thigh or below. So with that in mind, let's move into some of these plays. I think the first one we see right here is probably a, a classic chop block. What I want you to do is take a look at the left guard and, and center uh, in this play, and we'll let the play play through. You see right there, it happens very quick, difficult for the umpire, but our high combination block by the center, 77, and then the low part of the combination takes place right here. Uh, that, that's your classic chop that you see. That's one that's called. And as a result, I'll just uh, play it one more time. I want you to see this as it happens. Very difficult, but again, high block, combination low, and then uh, we have a foul on that. Next, we'd like to take a few minutes to define the horse collar tackle. Okay, one of the things that we want to talk about is a horse collar and really define what a horse collar penalty is. There's a lot of things that uh, we see happen on the field that, that may look like a horse collar, uh, that you may want them called as a horse collar, but they are not actually a horse collar penalty. Now the first thing that we always see is when someone grabs the jersey and they grab the outside of the jersey and they've got a handful and they pull it down. This by definition is not a horse collar. That is a tackle. That's pulling somebody down. A horse collar is when you get inside the jersey and inside the shoulder pads and pull somebody to the ground. If you get that hand in there and you tug them backwards a little bit and you let go and you don't bring the person to the ground, it is not a horse collar. It has to be a force where somebody grabs and pulls and that is the main force that gets somebody to the ground. Illegal helmet contact is another growing concern at all levels of football. Leading with the helmet is illegal in high school football. With the help of local official Mike Hoffman and our Parkway North football players, we'll describe to you what the illegal aspects to leading with the helmet are. The three Ill illegal uses of, of your helmet when you're tackling are, are, are called face tackling, butt blocking, and steering. The first one we're going to demonstrate is butt blocking, where the tackler uses his front of his helmet to run into the chest of his opponent while he's either blocking him or tackling him. Okay, so he's used his helmet there, and if he comes in starting at a much higher rate of speed there, that's going to damage him as well as the person he's tackling there by driving his, his helmet up into his chin and possibly hurting both of their necks at the same time. All right, the next one we're going to talk about is face tackling, where you lead with your helmet, and as you're tackling the runner, you come in like that with your helmet. Once again, bad form, very dangerous for your neck. And our last one is spearing. Spearing does not have to be intentional. Spearing is where you just lead with your head in an attempt to punish an opponent any place in the field. The runner can spear or the, or the tackler can spear as well. What about a ball carrier leading with his head? Okay, the ball carrier is the same way. If a ball carrier, as he's running, if he's in an open field or if he's attempting to punish an opponent while he's running with that ball, that is also spearing and that will also be a flag from 15 yards. The next section of our presentation will address some rules that are specific to the Mighty Might level of CIFL youth football. These rules are designed to ensure a safe, competitive, and learning environment for the youngest members of the CIFL. 
At the Mighty Might level, one coach will be allowed on the field. Once a team breaks the huddle, the on-field coach is no longer allowed to give instruction or directions. This coach must be silent for the duration of the play. Officials will offer a warning and then a 15-yard unsportsmanlike penalty if the on-field, on-field coach is in violation of this rule. An additional coach is allowed to travel from end zone to end zone on the sideline. This coach does not have any vocal restrictions once the huddle is broken. The remainder of the coaches must remain in the mandatory coaches box. Mighty Mike coaches should work with their players to call plays and conduct huddles in an efficient manner. The play clock for Mighty Mike games is 35 seconds. The play clock begins when the official blows the whistle indicating the ball is ready for play. At the Mighty Might level, linemen on both offense and defense must be in a three-point or four-point stance prior to the snap of the ball. Defenses may only have four defensive linemen. These linemen must be head up across from the offensive linemen and may not line up over the center. Any defensive player except the four linemen must be a minimum of three yards from the line of scrimmage. These players may not blitz or advance past the line of scrimmage until the ball has been handed off, thrown, or the quarterback has left the pocket. The pocket is the area from the tackle to the tackle. Blitzing will result in a 15-yard penalty. In 2011, the CIFL has approved a fourth official, which will increase the ability of officials to monitor any violations of the three-yard rule or the blitzing rule. Double stripers at any level of the CIFL are not allowed to participate on kickoffs or punts. Any other rules specific to double stripers should be addressed prior to the start of the game. This concludes our rules presentation. As a reminder, this video has not covered all the rules of football or the CIFL. As a coach or league official, it is important that you continue to review the rules of the game and the bylaws of the CIFL. The CIFL would like to take this time to thank you in advance for volunteering your time to coach this upcoming season. Without your commitment, our program would not exist. Thank you and best of luck in the upcoming 2011 season.